announcements, but please just say this. <laughs> All right. Uh, very good. So uh, today, uh, we want to uh, uh, continue in our uh, uh, study of uh, Zechariah. Okay, and while you're looking for that, isn't it a blessing when people come and join uh, the congregation, have wonderful have Clifford and Keishla and family to, to be with us. and Love that Syracuse uh, connection. I spent a couple of years. You know, I'm, I'm an upstate guy, born and raised in Albany, lived in a small town near Syracuse and, and Buffalo, and it's all good. All good in upstate New York. All right. Well, uh, did you find Zechariah in the Z's? Uh, you go to the Z's, go to the back of the book. And uh, we've been in the fourth chapter for a little while. Uh, and uh, it is kind of interesting. Uh, when Jared was uh, sharing this morning, he was saying how, in a way, uh, what we do mirrors what God does. And that is actually part of what's going on, uh, especially toward the end of the fourth chapter uh, of, uh, of Zechariah. So we have been in this for uh, a, little, a little while, uh, and really the theme of the chapter, of these visions, is the, uh, the ruach, the, the pouring out of the ruach, uh, the... Uh, the light uh, that the Ruach brings, uh, and, and so on. And, and we have said that sometimes people are surprised that we read uh, so much uh, about uh, the Spirit of God in, in the Tanakh. Uh, and, of course, we should not be surprised about anything uh, uh, along those lines because the Brit Chadashai is a continuation of the story. <laughs> you know, it's not a different book. And, uh, and we have to even be careful even in using the word fulfillment because that can also give the impression of jettisoning like, like the rocket that goes to the moon, right? Uh, you know, like the first part has fulfilled its purpose and so it's jettisoned and lands somewhere in the ocean, uh, you, you know, and propels uh, the rocket to go to the moon. Uh, but that is not the case either. It's just a continuation of the, uh, of the uh, story. In fact, even the Brit uh, Harashah portion uh, about the transfiguration, uh, the glory of God uh, being revealed, and there's Moses and Elijah. And of course, uh, wait till next Sukkot, and we'll talk all about what motivated Peter to say, let's build sukkahs, right? It, it was not uh, a coincidence, and it wasn't like, what, you know? It, there was a real meaning to it, in addition to the cloud. I mean, it's really, when you talk about uh, the uh, Jewish uh, essence of what it's made out of, you, you know, who, who we are and what Yeshua came to do, it's all, it's all right, uh, right there. And certainly, uh, doesn't that relate to the glory of the Lord filling the, the, the tabernacle, the presence of, uh, of God in our midst? And that has a lot to do with what's, happening here in the fourth chapter uh, of uh, Zechariah. So when we talk about um, this, we know that uh, the idea here is, is that God was encouraging the leadership uh, of the returnees to Judea, right? To Judah, right? He was encouraging them that they're, they're still uh, the chosen people, still in covenant relationship, that God has not left them, that the temple will be rebuilt, uh, you know, and that there is also a glorious future, right? So we could say that the first part, uh, what we talked about the first week we talked about Zechariah chapter 4, was the power of the, uh, of the Ruach, right? Not by might, uh, uh, not by our own strength, but by the Spirit of God. And, and there was a vision, the vision of this a lampstand and these two olive uh, uh, trees pouring a, a continual oil into the uh, lampstand, right? And, uh, and so the, the first uh, uh, meaning of that uh, is, is, is the power of God is present 
Uh, and uh, just like in the previous temple, just like in the tabernacle, just like in the wilderness, uh, and that God, even though you totally blew it, right, and ended up in Babylon, and only, uh, relatively speaking, a small number returned, the remnant re- returned, uh, that uh, the presence of God was still there and that he would bring it to pass. He would bring it to pass. As we read there in verse uh, uh, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Right? Now, it's really very interesting. In this, Zechariah, in this vision, Zechariah is taken by something because he continually asks about it and doesn't get an answer until the end. He sees the lampstand, and he sees the two uh, olive trees, uh, and he sees that there are these uh, pipes, like, connecting the, these two olive trees uh, to this glorious uh, menorah with, with uh, seven bowls and then seven other ones coming out of it, uh, right? Out of each one, 49 all, all together. He sees this whole thing, but his question is, I understand what a menorah is. What are these two olive trees? So first he asks that uh, uh, toward the beginning in chapter 4, right? When uh, you see in verse 2, he says, I see and behold a lamb stand all of gold with its bowl on top of it, and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one by the right side uh, of the bowl and the other by its left side. And then I answered, and I, and I said to the angel who was speaking with me, what are these? Okay? All right. And so the first answer is the power of God. The power of God, Zerubbabel, uh, you know, uh, and, and Joshua, the, the civil leader and the, the uh, high priest, that uh, I will bring this to pass. That's what God tells the prophet. Okay? But then there's a second Uh, meaning of this. And it is, therefore, don't be discouraged, but be be encouraged and don't worry what it looks like. Don't worry that this temple is uh, going to be smaller than Solomon's temple. Don't worry that Jerusalem doesn't look the same as it did years ago, right? So be encouraged. I am the same, right? My presence is the same, uh, within you. So, so therefore, I will bring it to pass and don't get discouraged. You know, uh, as it says uh, here uh, in uh, uh, verse uh, 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 8 and following, right? Uh, in verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? Right? In other words, don't worry that it is smaller. And last time we pointed out that in his contemporary, in Zechariah's contemporary, Haggai was the, you know, was basically the entire prophecy was to be encouraged. And what did we say to ourselves? Don't be discouraged. Perhaps, you know, perhaps you have been a Messiah follower for a long, long time, right? Uh, and, uh, and now uh, perhaps you're at a particular point in life. It might be kind of challenging in, in, in certain ways. Don't be discouraged. You know, uh, perhaps we remember, remember those days, remember the good old days, or uh, remember, uh, it, you know, the, the, the past and, uh, you, and, and maybe you're feeling uh, perhaps a little discouraged in the present. But no, God is the same. And, you know, do not despise different times of life. You know, do not despise uh, where you are now. If, in fact, God is leading you. Because, you know, uh, God has not changed. And, and so, uh, hopefully, we're encouraged uh, in whatever place we are in. And what does uh, Paul uh, say in a whole bunch of different places? We don't look at the things we can see, but it's what we don't see, right? Uh, and what we don't see is what is eternal. There is, in 2 Corinthians, which is toward the end of his life, toward the end of his life, uh, he, that's where he says, 
I, that, you know, internally we're being renewed day by day, but outside uh, our, our bodies don't remain the same, right? Uh, and, and so, therefore, we should not be uh, uh, discouraged. And now there's a third part, right? So we have, a, you know, empowerment, uh, we have uh, an encouragement, and then uh, number three, in a way, what we have is calling that the uh, spirit uh, uh, of God being present in their midst uh, provides all they need for Israel to continue and ultimately fulfill uh, the calling of being a light to the, a light to the uh, nations. So here we come now uh, to verse 11. And uh, Zechariah has not had his question answered. He says, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees? Like, remember? Uh, on the right of the lampstand and on its left. And I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches that are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the gold oil, the golden oil from themselves? It's like he's being real specific because he... He wants to get his question answered, and it, it hasn't been answered yet. And now, finally, uh, there will be the uh, answer. So he answered me. Notice asking a question is answered, and answering a question is answered, right? I, and, uh, of course, um, that doesn't, you know, you can give a whole message on anything. But uh, I guess what I could say is, is that questions are indeed part of walking with the Lord and uh, communing with God, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and praying is uh, asking questions. And that's kind of important for us to always remember. All right. Uh, so then we see, then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord uh, of the whole earth. Okay? The two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. So this is uh, rather interesting uh, about these two, uh, these two anointed ones. Who is standing uh, to the left and the right uh, of, the, uh, of the lampstand? And remember, in this kind of literature, I, I, you know, this is not like math. Uh, you, you know where, okay, uh, it's all concrete, right? that sometimes uh, what uh, is being said in a vision is perhaps a concept, an idea. Sometimes it's even a double entendre uh, throughout the scriptures, meaning several different things. But it kind of gives us the sense of what's going on. Okay, so first of all, the two anointed ones. In this, uh, in this period of time and in this context, I... Um, first of all, I'll say, if you ever read commentaries that go back in time and to the present, it's, so, it's fanciful, uh, you know, like fanciful things. It's uh, yeah. the two natures of the Messiah. I mean, geez, I don't think that, I don't think that uh, you know, Zechariah was getting any of that, you know, here. Probably, most likely, may I suggest, it's been a while, I think. That, uh, that it represents Zerubbabel and Joshua. Zerubbabel, uh, who was, remember, a descendant of David, uh, who was the civil leader, like a governor. They didn't have a king. So when they returned, Zerubbabel, it can get confusing. Zechariah is the prophet. Zerubbabel was the leader of the people, right? Uh, and Joshua was the high priest. And very interestingly, in the providence of God, Joshua was a Zadokite high priest, came, coming uh, originally from the line of uh, Aaron, uh, and Zerubbabel from the line of, uh, of David. And that these two are anointed uh, for service. Just like when we read about the building of the tabernacle, you had the Spirit of God filling the workers, <laughs> Right? giving them power, giving them wisdom, uh, giving them like a separation, a calling for, for a purpose. Uh, and, and so 
uh, what we have here are uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel uh, 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 being these uh, two anointed ones. But now we get into a little confusion because then the question is, how, if, if the lampstand, if, if we think of the lampstand as the presence of God, how could Zerubbabel and Joshua be filling God with oil? So now it gets a little more involved. And so what could this be? Now, even though I, when it says here, um, I, these are the two anointed ones standing by the Lord of the whole earth. In one way, you could see the menorah as the Lord of the whole earth, but perhaps the Lord of the whole earth is simply standing by everything. <laughs> you know, standing by the, uh, the two anointed ones, standing by the, the menorah, and in a way representing just the entire, the entire vision. Uh, and, and so it's rather interesting because there is nothing in the chapter where actually Zechariah, I wish he would have asked this question, what exactly is the lampstand? But he never asks that question, right? And so that leads to a very interesting uh, uh, thoughts. What could the lampstand be if Zerubbabel and Joshua uh, are, the, uh, are, are the ones who are anointed of God pouring into the lampstand? Uh, and so perhaps the lampstand represents a, the, uh, the, the calling of Israel. This is how ancient Jewish commentators understood the whole thing, that this is all messianic. This is all about the future. This is all about the great calling of Israel, that the presence of the Ruach in the days of the, of the early Second Temple period was like proof positive uh, and gave uh, the, a stamp of approval, so to speak, to Israel's maintenance in the covenant and means not only that God is with them in the present, but also in the future. Uh, having this glorious uh, uh, future. Uh, and, and so that perhaps, in, in, one, in one sense, it speaks uh, to Israel in that day that you are uh, my witnesses. And so, yes, God is present, certainly, uh, in, uh, in, the whole, in the whole vision, but perhaps the menorah here, right here, uh, is representing, in a sense, the, the you know, the, the people, uh, the presence of God, the people and the presence of God, the temple that God has indeed uh, uh, still uh, given the, the people this calling and this anointing. This comes also a little more clearer a couple of chapters later in Zechariah. Because you have in Zechariah, chapter 6, uh, another statement, a very interesting statement about the priesthood and the kingship. About the priesthood and the kingship. Now, one of the things that we know from uh, reading the uh, Tanakh, reading the Bible, is that generally speaking, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, everybody had to stay in their own lane right? That kings were kings, priests were priests. Kings don't try to be priests, and priests don't go out of your way to be the king, right? Because it only led to trouble, right? Uh, and so with the two uh, olive trees, uh, in a sense, what you have is not only Zerubbabel and Joshua, but you have the kingship and you have the priesthood, a, uh, that, that uh, God had not done away with, and that this is what I, you know, will uh, bring Israel to the fulfillment of her uh, calling, of being a light uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the nations. Then in chapter 6, if you look, uh, without all the background of it, there's another vision, and beginning in verse 12, it says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. And remember earlier in the second chapter, we read about the, the, uh, the branch, right? The servant, the branch. And now here, uh, we read about the servant again in the branch, that being the, uh, the branch, okay? And he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. So kind of interesting, you see that there is this one who is called the servant of the Lord, this one uh, who is going to be uh, called the uh, branch, and he is going to build the temple. He is going to be uh, the high priest. He is going to be the king. Clearly, uh, this uh, speaks of, from the point of view of this time period, it speaks to the future of the messianic age, of the days of Messiah, uh, when there will be the, the ultimate temple, uh, when the Messiah will, will rule, uh, and Israel will, again, like I said, be this a uh, light uh, to, the, to the nations, right? Uh, and, and so uh, what you see even in these visions is, is that it's all pointing forward, you know, to something, right? Now, it's also really interesting uh, that... Um, uh, you read in uh, uh, Isaiah in chapter 60. In Isaiah chapter 60, when we talk about, well, is the lampstand the light of God or is the lampstand the light of Israel? What is it, right? Uh, and that is, of course, our Western categorical minds thinking that uh, we've got to, when we talk about rightly dividing the word of God, it means we have to cut it up. Uh, you know, and operate on it, uh, you know. It, it reminds me a little bit, remember, as you're looking for Isaiah 60, remember the game Operation, right, where you got the little tweezers, and you sometimes we look at, that's, that's exactly, that's how we have to understand the Bible, that this goes in this, and this goes in this, and this goes in this, but you know, in the ancient world, that's not exactly how they thought, uh, and, and words were pictures, uh, and, and brought to mind, in this case, this idea of the glory of God and, and Israel being attached to the glory of God and fulfilling her, her purpose. And God has given his uh, stamp on its leadership. Uh, and we're not doomed, even though it might look that way. But God is still all-powerful. And wow, what a future it's going to be. Right? Right? So in Isaiah 60, you know this, probably from singing it as a song, uh, maybe. Uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you, not just to you. Right? Not just like you'll see it, but it will be upon you. And look, and the nations will come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. And so uh, when we read here, arise, for your light has come. This is speaking of, you know, this, uh, this great day. Uh, this great day of the brightness of the day of the, of the Lord, the consummation. Uh, and so the light of God comes upon Israel, and Israel is the light of the world. The nations see the light uh, and come to it, you know? And, uh, and, and that, uh, may I suggest, uh, perhaps might have been, you know, remember that Isaiah was written before, uh, Zechariah, and that this plays a role in what Zechariah was seeing uh, and understanding. 
Yes, the light of God coming upon the light of, of Israel. Uh, and that ultimately uh, it is the messianic king priest uh, who will perpetually shine uh, this light uh, upon uh, Israel. Well, there's more to this, right? And that is, if you go to the book of Revelation, and you look at the beginning of the book of Revelation, Revelation is built on the prophets uh, of Israel, okay? Some, I, 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 some people I, I use the terminology prophetic apocalypse, apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature. Prophetic, that it's, it's not just fanciful stuff that comes out of nowhere, but that it is rooted in the pages of the prophets. I, you know, I, if you go to a seminary, oftentimes the class on the book of Revelation is actually called Daniel Revelation, and, and not taught all by itself. But Zechariah uh, also plays uh, a role uh, in the imagery of the book of Revelation, right? So in uh, the first uh, a chapter, uh, you see uh, here, I, I guess I should start in verse uh, 10. I, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me, a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven, uh, you know, uh, uh, congregations, okay? Uh, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to uh, the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace." And his voice was like the sound of uh, many waters. And in his right hand he held out seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining uh, in, its, uh, in its strength. Right? And a little farther down in verse 19. Write therefore the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars, uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven congregations, and the seven lampstands are the seven congregations. So you see here uh, that uh, the Lord in his glory is in the midst of all of this right, is in the midst of all this. There's an identification of the lampstands and, you know, with the glory of God. And, of course, it, it means, like, you know, the, the, lamp, all, the, the congregations are the visible representation of, of God. And, and so he's going to have a lot to say to them because they're not quite living up to the calling uh, that they were called to be. But that's not all. If you go to the 11th chapter of uh, uh, Revelation, okay, uh, you, read, uh, you read this. Uh, in verse 3, save a few minutes, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone desires to harm, then fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone would desire to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. These have the power to shut up the sky in order that rain may not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them back into blood and to smite the earth 
uh, with every plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them uh, and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom in Egypt, uh, where also their Lord was crucified. And, uh, from the, and from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies and for three and a half days will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. It goes on. And then finally in verse 11, And after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet. Great fear uh, fell uh, upon those who were uh, beholding them. They heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here, and they went into the heavens and the clouds, and their enemies beheld them. Okay, well, now, you know, go ahead and decide who you want the two witnesses to be. Go right ahead, all right? But the, the, the point uh, of this is, is that they bear a really interesting resemblance to uh, how Yeshua is described in the first chapter, uh, as well as the power of God and what God does uh, you know, uh, throughout uh, the scriptures, uh, and uh, I'll just say whoever these two witnesses are, they are like a uh, they are are like an embodiment of who Yeshua, uh, you know, <laughs> of who Yeshua is. They die, they raise from the dead, they 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 are all powerful and and and, and so on. Uh, and uh, you know, it's interesting how John takes the imagery of the two olive trees uh, from Zechariah and recognizes them as two anointed ones who play this really unique role uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, and uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, show the power of God and to defeat the enemy and, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, some say Moses and Elijah that's fine. That was on the Mount of Tran They were at the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Uh, they they play uh, very uh, uh, unique roles uh, in in history, but nobody knows for sure. And and uh, you know, don't get sidetracked by having having to get that right. Uh, you know, but just realize what God is is going to do uh, at that time, just like He's going to do how how He was doing it in Zechariah's day. Uh, you know, and then of course, with the uh, coming of Yeshua, uh, as I, uh, we will learn in this uh, uh, MSI course, that the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, uh, and the pouring out of the Ruach are all this work of a Messiah that by Yeshua being at the right hand of the Father still continues to this day. And so we know that the coming of Messiah signaled the beginning of the end. You know, I, I was just uh, speaking uh, just the other day, actually, with a, a pastor in our city uh, about how, you know, the, the, the concept, the idea of resurrection is rooted in the pages of the Tanakh. It's in the Torah, and, and it's in the Prophets. It's not like some newfangled, newfangled Christian idea, uh, you, you know, just like the, the Holy Spirit, you know. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, the resurrection is the sign of the Messianic age, new life, the sign of the Messianic age. And by Yeshua's resurrection, uh, we have the beginning. His resurrection is the beginning of the end, not resuscitation. But resurrection uh, is the beginning of the end. And then in an invisible kind of way, when we embrace the Messiah, we join in that resurrection life, right? And the pouring out of the Ruach HaKodesh is the way we connect to that resurrection life uh, to this day. So that makes us light, just as Yeshua is light. So we, therefore, uh, become uh, light, right? Yeshua said, I am the light. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. 
the, the light of life. And, and in all these passages, it's not just in following the light, but you are the light. And of course, in the Tanakh, we read a great uh, prophetic statement about Yeshua, right? That he's the light of revelation to the nations. In Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. In Yeshua, God makes us a light to the world. We become, as it were, part of that menorah. Part of that menorah. You know, uh, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we read that those uh, who, are, who are not of Israel become part of the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, that, that means under the crown. doesn't mean you become Jewish, okay? It doesn't mean you change your identity, your, your ethnic identity, or anything like that. God loves all kinds of ethnic identities, you know? But we all come under the crown of Messiah. And so therefore, not only the Jewish people, but all who embrace the Messiah of Israel uh, are the light of the world. And oh, didn't Yeshua say something about that? I think so. Uh, it is uh, in the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter uh, 5. Very uh, quickly here, right? In verse uh, 14. You are the light of the world. Wow. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure. But let the lamp stand, but on the lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. I mean, how much clearer can that get, right? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And of course, right after that is when he says, you know, I'm not, I'm not coming to do something. I'm not creating a new religion, everybody. This is what was promised in the Torah and the prophets. That's why the very next verse says, do not think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. We don't cherry pick these things out. They're all, it's all connected right? Be what you were originally intended to be, and I have come to make you that in what God has done. Uh, and so I know the time is uh, real short. Uh, and so, you know, you can look up lots of different verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 and 2 Timothy 114, and we read very clear verses that the Spirit dwells in us. There's lots of verses that's th that infer it and say it. The Spirit of God indwells us. This is why the pouring out on Shavuot of uh, the Ruach is so, uh, is so important. Uh, it is, in a way, the, the real, the, what, what the, the Jewish commentaries look forward to someday, might happen, began to happen on Shavuot when the Ruach, when the Spirit of God was poured out. And we get to live on the other side of that. And that means that whenever you embrace Yeshua, the Ruach comes to indwell you. You know, yes, your sins are forgiven. Uh, yes, the, you know, you, you enter the road of sanctification and holiness and, and so on. But now we as Israel and human beings can finally begin to fulfill this calling of glorifying God and living that out in such a way that people see the light of Yeshua when they see us. And we are never absent of the light, always being poured in, always being poured into us. We're never empty unless we walk away. In other words, what do I mean by walk away? You know, if we don't receive... <laughs> It's all there. The question is, do we receive? Are we in the word of God? Uh, are we um, focused on the things of God? Do, are we people of prayer? Uh, or do we give God a tip? You, you know, now and then I'll show up for a service and sing a song. And, you know, uh, or, or that. Or, uh, you know, are we uh, a living sacrifice? Are we experiencing transformation in our lives? That's what it is. It's not, yeah, I'll try, it'll be okay. No. Am I or aren't I? 
That's really, uh, you know, our, our challenge. We are called to be this light. So we must live in the light, right? And speaking of uh, Ephesians, we read uh, uh, this clearly, that we become the light. We are the light. And this goes all the way back to this prophecy uh, of Zechariah. Uh, in uh, Ephesians, in the uh, fifth chapter, right? We read here, uh, you were f- uh, you were formerly, well, actually, it's let, verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of, of God has come a- upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. But instead even expose them. For it is is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So if we are children of light, we must live in the light. Let us not get the idea that I can hang out in the darkness, you know, and then come over to the light, maybe, you know, on Shabbat morning or, or uh, for, you know, other events, <laughs> but live in the, in the light. I mean, but live in the dark. Yes, it is true that we do. The world is darkness. But that is why we must live amongst each other and be a bright light Uh, that is attractive to the world, meaning not attractive in the sense of joining in with the world, but that the world may see what light really looks like and be able to see the contrast of darkness and light. But all things become visible when they're exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, Awake, sleeper, and 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 arise from the dead, For Messiah will shine on you. Right there out of Isaiah 60. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When people say, what is the will of the Lord? This is the will of the Lord, to walk in the light, to be light, uh, and, and so on. And, and that is why the next verse says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Yeshua, Messiah, uh, to God, even the Father, and be subject or yield to one another in the fear of Messiah. And then he's going to spend the rest of this letter explaining how to do that. In family relationships, work kind of relationships, I, I, and, just so, and social relationships, right? And so we must be filled with the Spirit. We must allow those two olive trees, which is a metaphor, really, of, of Yeshua, the Messiah, to keep filling us up. Keep filling us up. And do not get the idea that Yeshua is on vacation. And, and uh, you know, I, and that... Uh, you know, the, the Spirit of God is like, like a, almost like a separate uh, deity or, or, or something. No, Yeshua is the one. When, you, when we say, oh, Lord, fill me with your Spirit, Yeshua fills us with the Ruach. The focus is on the work of Yeshua, the, pro, the high priestly work of Messiah, Yeshua. He fills just like those two out. He continually fills us so that we can shine bright, not be dull, right? And finally, there's one other place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 about this being light. There's a lot of passages that talk about light. But in our Tuesday night and Wednesday morning uh, uh, Chabura groups, we just finished 1 Thessalonians and lived to tell the story. Yeah. Uh, and so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm going to read these verses. Uh, I'm probably going to jump around a little bit. Okay. 
Now as to the times and epochs, brethren, uh, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Uh, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman uh, with a child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day should overcome you, overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk uh, get drunk at night. Uh, but since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, helmet and hope of salvation. Right? For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining a salvation through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who died for us, that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, uh, just as you are doing. So understand, the problem in Thessalonica was they were, they were confused. This is a very early letter of Paul, very early. And Paul thought, and evidently taught, that it seems that, uh, you know, the Lord is going to come immediately, but, but we have some Messiah followers who are dying. And so we have Messiah followers who are dying. What's going to happen? Right? I thought he's coming. Are, have they, I thought there's no death. I thought, it's, I thought we have new life. But, but Messiah followers are dying. And so at the end of chapter 4, Paul is saying, look, you know, the day is going to come when whether you're dead or alive, you'll be with Yeshua. Dead or alive. And that's exactly what he's saying here in chapter 5. Whether you're awake or you're asleep, this is your destiny if you are light. Whether you die, whether you, you know, you're, you're there for the day, don't worry about that. That, uh, you know, that, that you will be with the Lord. And finally, Paul does come around in 2 Corinthians where he's, the, I can't decide, should I die or should I live? You know, uh, better to be with the Lord. Uh, but the point is here is that no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in our lives, that we are light and let us all live like children of light. We are children of the day. We all know after a certain hour at night, nothing good happens, right? Right? So we are children of the day. Let's live that way. We are light. Let's live that way. Let's live that way 24-7. Let us be light. Let us live in a state of light. Light and life. And so I'll just say, he goes on to say in verse 14, uh, he says, uh, live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, which means kind of like those who don't get with the program. Uh, you know, uh, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all people. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you and Messiah Yeshua. Do not quench the spirit, right? Uh, do not despise prophetic utterance, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And I'll stop. I'll stop there. That is a way of life. It's sort of like general axioms of this is, this is what it means to live uh, in the light. And so when we look at this passage back in Zechariah chapter 4, this was an encouragement to Zerubbabel and to Joshua, an encouragement to those people that in their day, you know, in the uh, uh, 400s, <laughs> You know, that God was BCE. God was with them. It points forward to the, the, the light of Messiah to come. Uh, and even for us today, it points forward to that day when, uh, you know, when Israel and, and, the, and all believers will fulfill this calling of being a light. 
uh, in this world. So if we live in a dark world. Let us not just be uh, shaking our, uh, you know, our hands and our wrists and uh, just lamenting the darkness and how horrible the darkness is, but let us live as life. And if we really desire to be, uh, you know, to change the world, let us do so by shedding light on this dark world. Let's pray.